We're very excited today to have uh, Jeff Beals join us, uh, who was a candidate in New York uh, in their primary for the Congressional District 19 nomination in the Democratic Party. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. So Jeff had a tough race. Um, uh, I first found out about Jeff because he was featured on the June 22nd edition of This American Life uh, on, a sh on a show called It's My Party and I'll Try If I Want To, um, just to talk about the the, the general parameters of the campaign that, that he faced. Um, unlike many of the, the races in New York, he had a number of uh, opponents. Looks like you had about seven. There were seven total candidates. Yeah, and so what that meant was the Democratic Party vote was split and there was actually not a lot of difference between uh, so, so, some of the, the, the uh, some of the the results. Um, it represents a district that is north of New York City and just skirts Albany over on the uh, eastern side of the state. Um, what was interesting was the amount of money that was then spent, and that's really the the, the theme that we're going to explore today is uh, how progressive candidates deal with money. So the incumbent. Um, had raised uh, as of June 6th uh, almost two million dollars and uh, the the candidate who won had raised 2.2 million dollars um, Jeff if I remember correctly you're you're you raised three around three hundred and fifty thousand yeah a little less than that and the point that was made in the story was that you know ten years ago three hundred fifty thousand dollars would have been sufficient amounts of money to uh, to run a congressional campaign but that's no longer the case um, and then of course the, the 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 most prominent race in the New York primary was Alexandra uh, Ocasio Cortez who apparently spent um, just about the same amount you did or less but she had no opponents and uh, the the big difference she she made in that campaign was that she out out walked her opponent uh, and did a ran a grassroots campaign, which we find here to be fairly effective. And so she was able to defeat her, her opponent in uh, without having the vast amount of money that he did. So was this your first time running for public office or had you done it before, Jeff? Uh, yeah, this was my first time running for office. Uh, I had a career in the government before and I was a United States diplomat, a foreign service officer posted in the Middle East. And before that, I was an intelligence officer in the CIA under the Clinton administration. And now I'm a high school history teacher uh, here in Woodstock, New York. Did you have a lot of students helping you on your campaign? I did have. Uh, we started with a small base of, of non-voting age students who were strong supporters of my campaign, but were way too young to cast a ballot. So we had to build from there and we built it a big way. Uh, but as I said to a lot of our supporters gathered on election night, uh, things were taking off, but you might say the runway wasn't long enough, but, uh, it, it was a, it was a great campaign. So, uh, a big issue here on, on the West coast is, uh, how, how do we approach money in politics and how do you run an effective campaign without selling your soul? Uh, you actually encountered, um, uh, situations where people were trying to get you to change your values. Could you tell us about that and what that was like and what they were trying to get you to do? Well, I believe from the start that Democrats shouldn't be losing races in red districts in the Midwest. They shouldn't be losing them in districts like mine in New York, which is a district that has been Republican for many straight terms, and that we lose them because uh, we don't present a real contrast to what the Republicans stand for. Uh, we are too compromised ourselves by our corporate donors, and the people tend to look at both parties, see two compromised corporate parties, and figure one of them is going to cut my taxes, and uh, the other one is going to raise them. So I'll go with the cut. Uh, but if we stood up for a strong progressive platform that would really speak to the small towns of, in this case, New York, and in a wider case America that have been eviscerated by corporate power and income inequality and the rise of a ginormous financial sector that we could win a lot more votes. So I put forward that platform because I believe in it, I need it. And it's obviously a lot of the things that Bernie Sanders uh, advocated in his campaign that Elizabeth Warren stands up for. That right away will handcuff any person trying to raise a lot of money from the traditional democratic donor base. No question about it. 
And of course, your situation in, in New York is a bit different than ours because we don't have as many rich people as you do being right next to New York City. Well, yeah, that's true. And that's part of why so much money poured into this race in the Democratic primary. And I mean, look, one of the things that anybody that's running for office has to understand that I would say I only half understood and maybe now I'm three quarters is that when you run for office as a progressive, you're agreeing to play a rigged game. Uh, the game is rigged because money is being allowed to control our races and influence them in enormous ways. And the contours of it amount to basically legalized bribery. Uh, it doesn't really pass the smell test, I think, for most Americans that any money should come into a congressional race that isn't from the congressional district. But of course, there are no such laws like that in our country. You can, sitting where you are, contribute to my campaign. I can contribute to yours. Uh, and any hedge fund uh, manager in New York City can dump enormous sums of money up into upstate New York in a race where they neither uh, live nor have a vested interest. And so that alone is off and wrong. Uh, then you have a problem of who will cut the type of checks that are required to really raise significant sums of money for a congressional campaign. We raised a lot of money off of grassroots fundraising, and I believed in it, and I continue to to this day. But the simple fact is that the maximum contribution you can get is $5,400 from a couple, $2,700 from an individual. And the number of people in America that can cut checks like that and are willing to, that are not tax deductible, that are just money invested in politics, is vanishingly small. And most of the people that'll do it will do it only for a reason, as an investment uh, in a uh, business outcome that they want to see happen. So you're in trouble if you're advocating something that is a platform for the people and not necessarily for big business interests. And you ended up in, in the middle. So uh, it, it, your, your message resonated with, with at least a segment of the population. Um, did, did you have trouble convincing people that money in politics was bad? Or do you think they have this, this, this fundamental understanding of what's going on or do they not care? Well, right away, right there, this isn't about I, money in politics. I understand is the subject that you want to talk about. And it's certainly at the heart of what's wrong with our political system. But money in politics isn't my campaign slogan. I do not think that most Americans are wake up in the morning wondering about money in politics as an abstract issue. What they care about is Medicare for all. They care about whether or not we're going to take action to raise wages, to forgive student loan debt, to raise social security benefits. Uh, are we going to stop endless war overseas, stop wasting trillions of tax dollars on that, and instead put it to work on something like a federal jobs guarantee that would raise wages and provide benefits to working people? That's what people care about. That's what I campaigned on. And the results were extraordinary. We were endorsed early on by the Justice Democrats, who are a national group of former Bernie Sanders staffers advocating positions like that. And what we noticed talking to them is that we have what's called a really high conversion rate. And a conversion rate means when you go to somebody at their door and you tell them your platform, they support it. Uh, a large percentage of them do. And they sign on to support your campaign. So... The results of our election really wind up reflecting how many people we could get that message to, uh, not people not responding to it. There was a tremendous response to it, but there was also a tremendous amount of money poured into the race to try to drown out that message and to try to elide the differences between progressive candidates and people that don't advocate progressive ideals, but want to convince voters that they do. And that's part of what the subject of the podcast was. We had a really um, startling case of deceptive advertising going on in our district, financed by millions of dollars of corporate money to convince people that candidates who support something called, they would call it universal health care, uh, are advocates of a national health program like Medicare for All. None of the candidates who said that were supporters of Medicare for All. The vast majority of the people in our district were supporters of Medicare for all and only wanted to vote for that. But they were uh, deceived 
by a lot of glossy mailers and TV ads in which they were told, hey, vote for me and I'll give you universal, affordable health care for everybody. And they had a lot of trouble realizing that that was actually uh, poll tested corporate speak for the status quo and not for the elimination of the private health insurance industry and the establishment of a national health program. Wow, interesting. Um, and I, 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 haven't, I haven't figured out how to deal with negative advertising and campaigns yet either. Um, do, did, did you try to combat that message or did you just try to ignore it and, and try to overwhelm it with boots on the ground? Well, we rallied a tremendous number of volunteers and, you know, we tried, I was featured in that podcast and elsewhere in articles in Rolling Stone by Matt Taibbi because I didn't hesitate in what were largely stage managed candidate forums to directly point out the deception in that kind of advertising and the nature of the campaigns that we were up against. But it's hard to get that message out to a lot of people, especially in a very large district like ours that comprises four different media markets, 7,900 square miles, uh, almost 11 counties. Uh, that's tough. So the results that we saw were actually really great. We, you know, if you, you, you can't tell it looking at the results there, but every campaign above us was over a million dollars spent. We were outspent three to one, four to one, five to one, six to one. The campaign that we're listed as being tied with was over a one and a half million dollar campaign. Uh, and we managed to uh, rival and rally against these campaigns. But it's tough. Uh, it's tough to match that level of advertising. And it's tough when progressive groups and even progressive leaders are uh, nervous about big money and nervous about realizing that you have to make campaigns winnable, not just wait until you assess the money that they're quote unquote viable. You've got to take risks for it and you got to step forward. And it really counts on each of us to say, is my politics going to be based on what I believe or not? So a lot of people did, but not enough. Uh, and we got pretty far. We didn't get all the way, but I would say we made a pretty good start. I, Larry, I'd want to jump in. You, you did amazing considering, I mean, you've had Justice Democrats, which is which is good. I was going to ask if you had the endorsement of the of the three big groups because Alexandria Ocasio had that. Um, but the, the, the other thing is, do you think, how much do you think her media time, that debate with Crowley uh, affected the outcome there? I'm sure that helped. Um, another thing that was going on here was a too large field. Um, and so, you know, you'll see a candidate down lower than me, a guy named David Clegg, uh, was a deacon and a pastor here who had a progressive platform, uh, that unquestionably split vote, uh, between us. And, you know, there's nothing you can do other than try to convince the other guy, you're going to wind up ahead of him and that he should team up with you. But it's hard to uh, get people to do that. So you have to build your campaign. You have to build your base until you're strong enough to hold the banner yourself, which is what I did do. I had Justice Democrats. I was also working with People for Bernie, which is a national grassroots collective behind his campaign. Um, they endorsed, as did the local Bernie Crack groups in, in a couple of different counties here. Nice. Hey, Larry, just so you know, uh, what he was talking about, the confusing language around health care is that's Jamie McLeod Skinner. That is her language. So Interesting. Yeah. It's that deceptive, I'm trying to look progressive, but I'm not really. Well, look, this whole thing about language is very, very important. Um, right now, we uh, are facing the same thing that happens all the time when a new progressive movement is on the rise. And what you face is not people arguing against it. Because I got news for you. We already won the argument. Everybody knows that these are the winning positions in politics right now. But what happened in the 60s and what is happening now is people try to co-opt those movements, uh, seize the surface elements of their language until you forget what the movement was. So you've got a group in the United States right now called End Citizens United. Have you heard about that, Pat? I know. Okay, well, that's a pack, and you will see lots of candidates saying, 
I've been endorsed by N Citizens United, and I hereby pledge to not take one cent of corporate money for my campaign. Sounds great, doesn't it? Um, that does not mean that the person running is a progressive Democrat or is not running essentially a corporate campaign. Why is that? Well, that's why I started off by saying that our election contribution rules right now are essentially legalized bribery. You can't get money directly from a corporation in the United States. That uh, is illegal. IBM can't write you a check. Apple can't write you a check. However, the CEO can write you a personal check. Uh, all the members of a lobbying law firm can, as partners individually, write you personal checks. And you, as a candidate, can collect and bundle all of those checks from all of those corporate interests, from every managing director at Goldman Sachs, and then stand and give a speech and say, I have turned down every dime of corporate money, and I will not accept a cent of money from corporations, only from individuals. And most people, you know, God love them, are not gonna know the difference. Why would they know the difference? So you actually have to look at the platform that somebody is running on. You can't listen or turn this into a money in politics debate because there's a thousand ways for people to disguise money in politics or frankly, even make grassroots sound like they are taking bribes too. I mean. All you have to do is look at anybody's list. I mean, I, I raised over $300,000. Go down it. Find whoever gave me $5,400. Go find out where they made their living and then say, hey, Jeff took $5,400 from an executive. What does that mean? You know, where else was I going to get $5,400? A progressive executive who I found who supported my campaign. So none of this is really good people to understanding how campaigns have to be run. I would start with the platform, make sure that the platform really is a progressive platform. And on that basis, try to figure out whether or not you're running a progressive campaign. So um, if you were to do this again, what would you do differently? Uh, I mean, I think we had a very unique and difficult situation here that was essentially uh, tough from the start. Too many candidates, the vote was split among a couple of strong progressives, me and another candidate. That was part of the structure of what was going on here. And there was really very little way out of it. Uh, so the only thing you can do in a case like mine is you know build your base. By the end of the campaign, I had uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of not only volunteers, but contributors from all over the United States because of both the press coverage, because of the message, because of my social media presence. It had all built and it was there and it was in place just in time for, oops, the election day. So next time you have it starting on day one and people know who you are. You know, it took a lot of time for people to even know who I was, uh, for me to build up both my platform and for people to hear me speak. Those are things that I think a lot of candidates just have to know, uh, and I reassure myself with, are things that you, that you can't, you, you, you have to start somewhere. Uh, so start there. In my case, I had a lot of government experience, and I have through this before, um, and I knew that I was hacking away at the root of so many things that I saw go wrong in my government career. And so it was invigorating to be fighting what I thought was the core of the problem. And the problem is, you're right, money in politics. Um, and the way to fight it is, is grassroots energy. I wish there was an alternative. The one thing that I would want to happen, and I hope being on this show can happen, is that we forge wider ties among progressives across the United States who want to see this change happen. What I was trying to do was unique in a way. I was taking the Bernie Sanders model and applying it to a congressional race. But when you uh, do the Bernie Sanders model nationally and you add up 27 bucks across the United States, you can get to quite a substantial sum, especially with his notoriety and with his coverage. When you do it inside one congressional race uh, and you're just starting, that's tough. That's tough to get those numbers to add up. But I think that they can. 
that's why what I'm doing now is working with a lot of activists that I joined with to continue in the form of a PAC that will help progressives running in red states across uh, red districts across the United States, because that's where I think it's most important that we put this message forward and where it's going to make the biggest difference for the country. Is, is your PAC national or is it uh, uh, East Coast regional? It's going to be national. We're just forming it now and we're working with groups that I'm already involved in in helping like Justice Democrats. You know, I, I think that we're at the start of a movement. And so you can't ask for it to already get there. But the fact that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did win uh, is encouraging and, you know, is the beginning of something huge. So, look, you know, if you if you talked about a campaign like mine before the 2016 presidential primary, it wouldn't have even existed. And now here we are. So if you looked at how many Democrats in Congress support care for all before, you would have thought really anybody did. Well, now you're up to about 121 Democrats that are co-sponsors to the bill. These are enormous strides in, in a short period of time. So if we can get there before our entire democracy collapses, that'll be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we have... We, we... <laughs> What you point out is really good to remember that we're at the beginning and everyone wants instantaneous results. And even though the progress that, that's been made is amazing in the time that it's happened, uh, everyone still wants it to happen faster. Well, yeah. And I'll name you one other thing that's really important that I do propose that people start pushing for a little bit more. One of the real myths that was going on in the race that I was in here were people saying, and you can hear it in that podcast, Oh, well, Jeff Beals is not raising enough money to compete uh, in a congressional race. And you have to raise $2 million in order to face down the Republican incumbent. I was never disputing that. And that was a bit of deception being used by national Democratic leaders. Um, the race against the Republican is only beginning right now after the primary. We were in a Democratic primary between Democrats. That was the race that I was raising money for. And what wound up happening in our race was that candidates who claimed that they were raising enormous sums of corporate money to face down the Republican spent all of it to suppress and defeat the progressive Democrats running in their flank in the primary. Now they're back to the same zero that I'm at but they're just going to restart raising that money all over again to run in the general election. The Democratic Party might not be able to achieve campaign finance reform on a national level right now because of the Supreme Court, because of the structure of Congress and our government. But there is no reason that the Democratic Party can't more seriously advocate campaign finance reform within our party. Why are we allowing our primaries to be decided by big dollar donors? Why wouldn't we take action as a party to stand against that and let our primaries be true contests of ideas before we all enter into the understandably vaster arena of the general election where you got to pile up what you can? Uh, that's the lie that took place in the election I'm in. I even heard a little trace of it when you said, oh, well, you finished right there, you know, in the middle um, you know, well, it looks like, you know, some people agreed with you. Don't, don't look at the results. Now. You're right. There was $2 million spent by a candidate to achieve, uh, 22% of the vote, $2 million. Then you have a candidate like me who spent around $300,000 to achieve about 2000 votes less, uh, 13% of the vote. Um, that was an enormous outlay of special interest and corporate money to prop up a campaign and try to leave in the shadows other campaigns. That was not a case of some massive public rallying to corporate politics. They're not like, they don't like it. They don't want it either. But how are they supposed to tell the difference? Nobody announces it that way. So we have to be bold, stand for what we're standing for, and try to demand that the Democratic Party actually practice what it preaches. That is a really intriguing idea. Have you discussed this with the New York delegates to the DNC? Well, there's going to be a lot of resistance to it. I know some of these people, and you know, I, I, I spoke with one of them on the phone the other day, and he just 
you know, they don't, a lot of them don't see a, a problem with the system as we have it right now. It's, it's, you're not, we're not entirely dealing with people that agree with us. There are a lot of people who, you know, if you told them that we have catastrophic income inequality in America and a corporate takeover of our political system that has to be stopped before we slide entirely to oligarchy, uh, they're going to look at you like you're a, a raving, uh, apocalyptic preacher. Uh, I don't see it that way. You know, I happen to see a lot of merit in the writings of Thomas Frank and the um, political platform of, of Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. And I trace it back to Teddy Roosevelt. And I don't even see why these things have to be democratic alone. But this is a fight. So we can argue it. I think we should stand for it. And I think a change could come. Well, this has been fascinating and you've actually given us some good ideas. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing, Jeff? Well, I hope people will, you know, follow, will, will keep following both my campaign and this cause on a larger level. Um, they can sign on to our email at, uh, it's still right now, beelsforcongress.com will transition uh, to another forum in the near future. They can find me on Facebook um, at Jeff Beals. They can find me on uh, Twitter at Jeff Beals NY19. And uh, we're going to keep building this. I will be back in my classroom in the fall, but I'll be also out in the streets here and I'll be working with other justice Democrats across the country uh, until we win. And I think we've taken a big step forward towards doing it. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been uh, a, an honor and a delight to talk to you. Thank you so much. Hope we can stay in touch. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.